uh, we've been doing in trying to understand the dynamics and uh, try to find also experimental signatures of the early stages of uh, high energy heavy ion collisions and uh, so in this talk so this talk today is mainly both uh, based on some recent work with my uh, postdoc charge and do and then uh, also some uh, even more recent work uh, together with uh, all, again my postdoc and other collaborators uh, in, in Sakle. Okay, so uh, this brings me then to the outline of my talk. So I'll start with sort of a brief introduction and uh, motivation into why should we care about uh, non-equilibrium QCD or the early stages of heavy ion collisions. Um, I will then sort of uh, give you a little bit of a background about the theoretical tools that we use and what we generally understand about uh, uh, equilibration mechanisms of QCD plasmas, and then we'll come back to how this applies to the early stages of heavy ion collisions and what are sort of possible ways that we can, uh, that we hope to probe this in present and future experiments. Okay, so let's start with the motivation. So why do we, why are we interested in, in high energy heavy ion collisions in the first place? And uh, well, the reason, the, the reason for that is that they um, allow us to probe QCD matter, so strong interaction matter under very extreme conditions. So shown here on the right is a, is a typical uh, depiction of the phase diagram of QCD, different phases uh, as a function of the temperature and the baryon chemical potential. So the meta to antimeter asymmetry. And so normally we live in a world of uh, confined QCD matter. Okay. However, if we, if we go and heat QCD matter up to, to extreme temperatures above say on the order of 150 MeV or so, then um, we can deconfine the quarks and gluons inside uh, inside hadrons and we can form, we can pr uh, produce this new phase of the quark gluon plasma. Okay, and so um, as is illustrated here by these sort of little blobs, this is exactly kind of what is, uh, <laughs> what is the aim of a heavy ion collision experiment. So there the idea is that you take heavy nuclei such as gold or lead, you accelerate them to very high center of mass energies, then essentially smash them on top of each other. And thereby you sort of have such a large energy density in a, in a small enough volume that you can create these really extremely hot and dense states of matter where quarks and gluons deconfine and uh, you can create such a deconfined quark gluon plasma for a very short period of time. So this is kind of the, kind of the, the, the bird's eye view of, uh, <laughs> of why we want to study heavy ion collisions. Now uh, let's, let, let's face the reality and let's see what, what actually comes out of such an experiment. Um, and so what actually comes out of such an experiment is somehow depicted uh, here in the bottom right. So this is a picture of an event display at uh, um, uh, at the LHC from the CMS experiment, where you can see well what actually happens if you if you perform such a heavy ion collision is that you produce tens of thousands of uh, of particles, mostly pions, kaons, protons, and the likes. Okay, which you can see here by these by these kind of blue lines. Okay, um, lots of energy deposition in the different calorie meters, so you really have multi messenger probes, so to say, but the real purpose of showing you this picture is that what actually goes on in a heavy ion collision is sort of much more complicated than just drawing somehow a simple trajectory in the in the QCD phase diagram. And so whenever you want to go and actually learn something about fundamental properties of QCD from a heavy ion experiments, this sort of uh, really requires a very profound understanding of the of the whole space-time dynamics that's going on in collision. And that leads from a state which is as simple as two atomic nuclei to these, these very, very complicated pictures that these experiments pro uh, produce. At the same time, this also means that, of course, because you're operating such a very complicated experience, you also potentially have access um, to, uh, to investigate more than just say properties of the QCD phase diagram. For instance, you could also hope to learn something about non-equilibrium features. Of that. Okay, so with that, uh, let me say how we, how we generally think about the dynamics of such, uh, of such collisions. And so, well, of course, we all know that uh, some of the underlying theory that should describe this is, is QCD. Really to, to develop a dynamical description of a heavy ion collision from QCD is uh, is not possible and will presumably also not be possible throughout my entire lifetime. So this is really an outstanding challenge. Um, so since we cannot use some of the fundamental theory directly, what is uh, what we typically do is that uh, our standard model of describing a heavy ion collision is instead based on somehow a hierarchy of effective theories of QCD, so effective macroscopic descriptions of QCD matter, um, which essentially exploits the fact that if you actually look at what is going on in a heavy ion collision, there's sort of a clear separation of time scales in the reaction dynamics. Okay. 
And so this is to some extent illustrated over here. So let me walk you somehow through the different steps a little bit. So before the collision, of course, uh, when we collide uh, these ions in high energy, we have these sort of highly Lorentz contracted nuclei. They approach each other in the area where they um, where they sort of hit each other, um, they will mostly pass through each other, but they will deposit this uh, this large chunk of energy um, in the initial uh, in the initial state. And the time that they take to pass each other is actually extremely short. It's much, uh, a, I mean, it's it's a very small fraction of a Fermi over C or so. So immediately after this this sort of short collision time, the short time that the actual collision takes at high energies, this then leaves us with a sort of highly excited far from equilibrium state following this, this violent collision of the two, of the two atoms, um, which, uh, which then uh, typically is sort of assumed to relax back towards equilibrium on something like the time scale on the order of one Fermi over C or so, when we, we can really start talking about having trajectories in the QCT phase diagram. So we're sort of close to equilibrium. Um, and we then subsequently use relativistic viscous hydrodynamics to describe the space-time expansion of the quark gluon plasma. So here we're in a state where the energy densities are high enough to produce this new state of matter, the quark gluon plasma. Okay, but this is somehow created in, in essentially an empty space, and it will sort of rapidly expand behind the behind the two nuclei as they fly out of each other, and then later on also in the transverse expansion in the transverse direction to the beam axis, okay? And thereby the plasma will cool and will get colder and colder until eventually you no longer, I mean, the temperatures are no longer uh, sufficiently high to retain, to, to remain in this quark gluon plasma phase. So quarks and gluons somehow recombine into hadrons. These hadrons reinteract with each other a few times before essentially they become free streaming and then at asymptotically late times, so to say, reach the detectors where they produce this incredibly complicated picture, okay? And so for a long time, somehow the situation has been that, uh, um, so this is the typical thing that's done is that uh, one essentially tries to parametrize the, the properties of the initial state, such as it's created after a time scale of one Fermi over C where the hydrodynamic expansion sets in, then describes the hydrodynamic expansion, the substrate and hadronic phase, compares the outcome to the experimental measurements. And thereby one can, on the one hand, get a very successful phenomenological description of the of all the, uh, of essentially all the experimental observables, okay? But then of course, one can also learn something about the equilibrium and transport properties of the quark gluon. Now, of course, if you're a theorist and there's somehow, you know, this is somehow not fully satisfactory, okay? Because really what you would like to do is you would like to kind of take this reaction and describe it sort of for the, for the very beginning, from the very beginning, starting with atomic nuclei to the very end, starting with the measurement that you perform in experiments, okay? And uh, this for a long time has been, has been somewhat of a challenge, okay? So despite the fact that we have a very successful genealogy, phenomenology, it has been actually kind of proven challenging to understand how, how does it come, you know, following this violence of the collision that we really form a nearly equilibrated quark gluon plasma and can describe it in simple terms of macroscopic properties such as the energy density and flow of the plasma um, on a relatively short time scale on the order of one Fermi over C. And so this is certainly one reasoning for, uh, for studying um, what, is, what are general patterns of equilibration of QCD plasmas. Now, um, clearly one of the cases where we, where we need to understand such non-equilibrium processes in QCD is in heavy ion collisions. Um, personally, I, I always like to think that there's also another interesting example where, where, where actually rather similar questions could be relevant which is if you look at the early universe. Now, of course, at the sort of at the, at the very beginning, our early universe was also in a very hot and, uh, hot and dense state. Well, actually, um, um, actually, uh, actually following the period of inflation, of course, the energy density was high, but there was somehow, it's not really clear what, a, what amount of the standard model matter was present at this stage. And so, a similar question that you may ask, uh, where you also have to care about certainly the equilibration of the QCD sector, how does it actually come that uh, um, the standard model matter was produced in the early universe and also equilibrated at some time between the end of inflation and uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is really when you need a thermalized standard model matter around to um, somehow uh, successfully generate all the elements. 
Uh, so now, of course, the second question is much more complicated because it may, you know, <laughs> may depend very crucially on some of unknown particle contents at very high energy scales. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, there's at least some hope that you know, in, in, in sort of uh, trying to understand this first question, you may at some point have something interesting to say also, also about things that could have happened in the world. Okay. So uh, with this kind of motivation, let me then um, uh, go on and then tell you a little bit about uh, somehow uh, how we understand equilibration of QCD plasmas and sort of different equilibration mechanisms that can take place. And so basically the idea of this is gonna to give you a little bit of a, of a feeling of the microphysics that, uh, that is going on at the very early stages of a heavy ion collision. Okay, so, um, before we, so before we come to the actual physics, um, is there a question here? I see a question in the chat. Oh no, the talk's being recorded. Okay, all right. Um, so, so let me introduce the sort of the theoretical tools that we can do. So um, what we want to do is we want to describe somehow a thermalization process or study thermalization non-equilibrium dynamics in QCD. And this is this turns out to be a very, very hard problem. Okay, so uh, just on very general grounds, there's uh, no exact way to study non-equilibrium dynamics actually in any interacting quantum field theory in, in sufficiently high dimensions, um, and uh, let alone a theory as complicated as QCD. So we have to live with some sort of approximation. So in the context of uh, QCD, it turns out that uh, there's essentially two different limits where you can nevertheless perform first principle studies. And... Um, and uh, the first of them is uh, if you consider not theories which are QCD, but which feature some of our higher symmetry content, such as supersymmetric Young Mills theories, then if in addition you take the limit of large Torft coupling, you can get a description of real time dynamics using holographic methods. Okay, but then you have left the realm of QCD and you're studying theories which are similar, but okay, they're strongly coupled gauge theories at the center. So you may hope that uh, to some extent you can learn something. The other avenue, and that's what we're going to pursue in this talk, is uh, to stay within the realm of QCD. So to consider the weak coupling limit, not of related theories, sorry, this is a typo, but the actual weak coupling limit of uh, the theory itself, so of QCD, okay, where then you really have a description of, uh, of non-equilibrium dynamics of QCD in terms of the fundamental degrees of freedom, which are quarks and gluons, okay, and uh, and weak coupling, there's different techniques that you can use. We'll be primarily using kinetic theory, but you can also, under some circumstances, do uh, real-time lattice simulations. And a lot of the results, that, or some of the results that I'll be showing, have actually been kind of uh, uh, backed up from either side. Okay. So now, of course, Sorry, if you want to, uh, yeah, I think Raji had a question. Maybe he can ask uh, himself. Uh, Hi, Soren. How are you? Hi. I, my question was actually about the strong coupling and the SUSY part. Is there any such calculation for uh, non suzy theories? Um, I think there have been, yeah, I think there have been uh, corrections been calculated, yeah. No, um, you, to begin with, you start from theory which has no supersymmetry at all. Can you do a strong coupling calculation of the kind you mentioned? Um, I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what we'll do here is that we will, uh, so we will use a weak coupling description, which is based on leading order QCD kinetic theory, and we'll use that to describe non equilibrium QCD plasmas. Now, of course, if we actually go to uh, want to apply our findings to heavy ion collisions, okay, um, we have to be aware, aware that eventually we'll the coupling is not all that weak, okay, and we'll have to extrapolate our findings to some kind of realistic coupling strings uh, where the gauge coupling is on the order of two, say, at the relevant scales uh, of Rick and LHC experiments. Okay, so uh, with that being said, so let me introduce what then the theoretical description looks like. So if we stay at leading order and weak coupling, then uh, the dynamics is described by a relativistic Boltzmann equation. So uh, quarks and gluons, so phase based distributions of quarks and gluons can undergo free streaming and they can suffer um, from elastic and inelastic uh, collisions. And uh, um, really, this is so, so this kinetic theory of QCD has some uh, has a very interesting structure in a sense, which uh, which in many in many ways is, is very unique to QCD or non abelian gauge theories, and uh, therefore also just makes this somehow an interesting problem in statistical mechanics to actually see how such a system will thermalize. Okay. 
So on the one hand, so what is what is very so what is somehow special about the, the, the kinetic description of QCD from say other condensed matter systems or so? So on the one hand, we're dealing with ultra relativistic massless quasi particles, which are so explicitly really considering the gluons and the, the, the three light flavor quarks and antiquarks. The other thing that is very special about QCD is that um, we have both elastic and so elastic two to two and inelastic effective one to two processes, so number changing processes appearing at the same leading order. Okay. And um, this is actually kind of easy to understand why this happens, okay? Because of, I mean, of course we're dealing with the particles which are charged under, um, um, under the color charge, okay? And so, I mean, of course, charged particles, they interact with each other to, to essentially the exchange of long range fields. So at the perturbative level, a particle which is very far away will see the color charge of another particle. Now, of course, in the medium, this is screened by, by day by screening, but nevertheless, there will be lots and lots of interactions with a very small momentum transfer, which is actually only rela related by the in medium screening. Uh -huh. Okay, now, since these particles are charged, it is sort of frequently, um, they frequently uh, frequently encounter interactions with other with other quarks or gluons in the plasma. Well, that each each interaction essentially leads to an acceleration of a charged particle, which can lead to emission or absorption of radiation. Okay, and this is what promotes these uh, these uh, these uh, Bremsstrahlung type processes, where say a gluon, say a quark, can radiate a gluon or so also to the same leading order. And in fact, it turns out that you know essentially an arbitrary number of rescattering can occur um, over the course of, uh, uh, of emitting such radiation. So you actually have to account for recoherence effects in this type of, uh, in this type of interactions as well. I think there's a question by Sorendu, yeah. Hey, uh, so uh, since we're starting from the basics, I mean, this uh, Boltzmann equation that you have written down, mm -hmm. how gauge invariant is it? How gauge invariant is it? This is a good question. Uh, well, I mean, the Boltzmann equation is gauge invariant, right? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, perturbatively, right? How do you isolate uh, gauge effects into a collision term without having a P mu, a canonical P mu here, that is mechanical P minus EA? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, so, so what you're dealing with, right? So let's think about this. Um, I haven't, <laughs> so I haven't gone through the derivation a long time. Um, so I mean, I mean, the distributions you deal with, right, are color average distributions, right? So, so nothing carries color inside this distribution anymore, right? I mean, because you have a statistical mixture of, of all the color states, right? So, so I think that's so. I th and, and then essentially the fluctuations of the gluon field that surround you, right? They are absorbed in this kind of uh, gluon exchanges, right? But then you won't have the diagram that you've just written down, right? Which one? This one here. The gluons. If the gluons are gone, if it's color singlet, if it's color averaged, then. Ah, yeah. Sorry. So, so this is to read such that you undergo. So you undergo a soft. So, so, the, so the idea is you're sort of a charge. So you, you're a gluon, say, right? You interact with another gluon. Okay, and this triggers the emission of radiation. Yeah, so there's so to say another kind of spectator flying by here. Yeah, and that's actually what one. enters the rate. The, the two first to one. Two. Yeah. The two to two. Yeah. How would you get gluons to couple to the quark there? Which these ones? But yeah, this is just the, I mean, this is just the intermediate propagator that appears in the calculation of the matrix element, right? Yeah, but I mean, if this uh, function is uh, gauge invariant, if this function is color average or gauge invariant in some way, then there's no coupling. How do you generate that coupling? No, but this is, I mean, here's, so here's how you can technically do the calculation, right? So you start from, Okay, so 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 I mean, so, so so here's what you can do, right? So 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 say you start with a, so say you start right to write down um, um, color of BAME equations. Okay, so you fix you fix say you fix a class of gauges, right? So say you stay in, 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 in the covariant class of gauges, right? Yeah, um, you write down the evolution equations for two point functions, right? Then okay, you'll have some usual free part. Okay. You'll have so parts I, I which, which are so sensitive to the self energies, right? Yeah, you yeah. fix a gauge. 
and then you proceed. But then, of course, uh, the unless the gauge field yeah, is but zero, at the end, this, this is what I was about to say. So at the end, the hmm. depends on the gauge fixing parameter goes away. Yeah, that's fine. But you would still have a have an interaction term of the kind p mu minus a e a mu or alpha. Well, if you have a background, a. yeah, if you have a background color field, but you don't have background color fields, right? I mean, these are explicitly non-gauge singlets, right? Maybe for leading order it works out. Is that your claim? No, no, no my, my claim is there is no, I mean, this, this background gauge field would be an expectation value of a, would be an expectation value of a color field, right? Uh, so it would be the expectation value of a mu that you would couple to. I mean, this is an so this is this is this is so to say the first non-trivial in the set of evolution equations for expectation value, right? The expectation value well, of a gauge field is a non-color singlet that vanishes, right? So the two-point function can be a singlet. This is non-zero, right? But then any one-point function that would enter there would just vanish no, trivially. Well, why, why do you have to have a classical field there? After all, the f that you're writing down here, the mm -hmm. f is for a for the distribution of a quantum particle in some limiting sense where uh, you know phase space effects can, you, know, you probably write down Wigner distributions and so on. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so there's the quantum fields that correspond to the gluons and those quantum fields should interact with the fermionic fields by a P minus GA. Okay, so what happens to the P minus GA when you come to the Wigner distribution? Yeah, so, okay, so, so this A, okay, so what you call P minus G A, okay, this is essentially split up into a one point function, okay, so an expectation value of the A, that is zero, okay, and so to say the fluctuations of that field, okay, which actually become this retarded propagator here. Yeah, yeah so maybe this. Uh, perhaps this works at uh, one loop. I mean, sorry, leading order, three level. Does it work beyond that? Or you don't what, worry because what, what right work now beyond you... that? Okay. Okay. Perhaps. Okay. I mean, maybe maybe, maybe, maybe we can come back to this later. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Good. So. Okay, so, so we'll be using this, this leading order effective kinetic theory of QCD. Okay, and so while this theory somehow has been written down actually a long time ago, I think almost 20 years ago, really where we, we, there's been a lot of progress now coming in the last say five to 10 years or so is, um, is by actually being able to develop numerical solutions of this kinetic uh, theory. And uh, just for those of you who care, so I mean, the way we solve this is really like as the way, uh, the in, as the way this is written as an integral differential equation somehow using finite element techniques and um, no, no sort of test particle sampling or things of the like. Okay, so with that, let's, uh, so, so let's see how, how some of thermalization in the QCD plasma um, can play out. And um, it turns out that uh, non-abelian gate theories such as QCD actually feature two sort of qualitatively uh, different type of uh, type of thermalization patterns. Uh -huh. So if you consider really systems which are not particularly close to equilibrium, but really sort of far from equilibrium initially, okay, then you can basically distinguish them into sort of two broad classes of, uh, of systems. Uh -huh. Um, which we call overoccupied or underoccupied. So an overoccupied system is a system which features a very large phase space density of low energy degrees of freedom. So the idea is if you look at sort of a, uh, a picture of the phase space distribution as a function of the momentum, you would have this sort of huge occupancy of, of, of low energy degrees of freedom, okay? Um, with energies much smaller than the corresponding equilibrium temperature. Whereas for an underoccupied system, you would kind of have realized the opposite uh, situation where you have a very small density of very high energy particles. So the typical situation uh, for that would be, say you picture an ensemble of very high energy jets with no surrounding medium. And then you would ask yourself, well, how does it, how does it actually come that uh, such a system thermalized? And so, it turns out that uh, in both of these cases, the way that the, the, the thermalization works um, actually has very interesting links to uh, physics of turbulence. So what happens in the, in the overoccupied case is that for the system to thermalize, actually what needs to, be, what needs to happen is that somehow through multiple scatterings, these soft particles need to increase their momentum uh, until 
at some point you have momenta or energies on the order of the temperature, okay? And so the way that this happens is on the one hand to two to two interactions or to two, two soft particles merging, okay? And uh, uh, thereby they kind of continuously transport energy from this sort of low scale to this high scale in a fashion which is actually very similar to, um, um, which is very similar to, uh, to, uh, um, to uh, decaying turbulence. In the other case, when you have uh, when you have an underoccupied plasma, so you just have somehow a very small number of uh, of high energy particles. What happens? Uh, the, the thermalization works in a, in a sort of different way. So there, what can happen is that sort of these these these, um, these different high energy jets interact with each other, and this will trigger the emission of soft radiation. Okay, so very quickly, what will happen is that you will somehow radiate some very very soft quanta. Okay, which then can scatter among themselves and also with the hard jets and thereby create somehow a soft thermal bath. Okay, so this will, so as you continue to deposit radiation at, at low energies, this will then kind of start to heat up the temperature of this bath until eventually this bath becomes to dominate and you're basically left with a few hard particles which lose their energy to the bath and this they do to actually kind of undergoing sort of multiple, more or less multiple quasi-democratic splitting, so where they basically, the hard particle splits multiple times into uh, quanta of equal energy, okay, until the energy is so small enough that basically this can, um, this can thermalize with the bars. And so this is what's called, uh, so this is, so while the left type of mechanism of an overoccupied plasma is something which you can find actually relatively generically, even in, in scalar field theories or cold atom systems, turns out that this evolution that you find for other acute plasma is really something that is very unique to um, to, to non abelian plasmas such as QCT. Okay, so um, so let me let me show you a little bit more how this looks like in if you do this in detail. Okay, so here I show you now the evolution of a or the thermalization process of an overoccupied plasma of quarks and gluons. Now, okay, so what we do here is we go to very weak coupling on the order of, so Toft coupling on the order of 0.1, certainly much, much weaker than realistic. And on the left, I show you the evolution of the gluon distribution as a function of the momentum and on the right of the distribution of quarks. So such a system, which has lots and lots of low energy particles needs to be necessarily dominated by gluons simply because occupancies of quarks are suppressed due to the uh, Pauli exclusion principle, okay? And so initially the system is kind of fully dominated by having this very large phase space occupancy of, uh, of, of gluons, yeah. So since this is a very dense system, what will happen then is that uh, initially the scattering rates in the systems are very large. And so it doesn't really matter what kind of state you start from, okay? So very quickly, the system will actually encounter an initial memory loss, okay? And uh, as these particles start to, uh, start to interact with each other, they will kind of reach a distribution. So they will increase their momentum and sort of reach these, these distributions, which are shown here over here in green. However, this, when the system is in this state, okay, it kind of still faces the same challenge, namely, okay, I have my particles all have much lower energy than they would in equilibrium, okay? And so um, for that reason, kind of the same process just repeats itself over and over again, okay? And so what you actually find that after, after a time, which is essentially on the order of a, of a single scattering time in the, initially, um, the system enters such a self-similar evolution of the gluon distribution, whereby energy is transported from low scales to large scales. Uh -huh. And so um, what you find is that you can actually, so actually the physics really in this whole intermediate regime doesn't, doesn't really change. In fact, you can scale the distributions on top of each other and um, the dynamics is really just described in terms of uh, simple scaling exponents and, and one kind of scaling function, which takes, takes roughly this shape. Uh -huh. Okay, and so this basically continues, um, and this continues until eventually your particles reach uh, the scale of the equilibrium temperature. Actually, in this case, turns out uh, first they, the gluons acquire a little bit too much energy before they really produce the quarks and then relax back to equilibrium. But then once, uh, uh, I mean, once, uh, once you have acquired, uh, once essentially this energy transfer from infrared to ultraviolet is completed, um, the system thermalizes and it's actually this last step of thermalization that takes the most time in the, in the, in the entire process. So the evolution slows down across the entire evolution. Relocate. 
Now, you can also look at what happens in the quark sector. And so uh, what turns out is that actually quarks in this process, they are produced, uh, at the, they're really only produced in the sort of in the very final states efficiently. So they're actually produced very, very slowly. And so they're completely sort of subdominant and essentially throughout the entire course of the evolution, the quark distribution simply follows that of the gluons. And eventually the system dermalizes on a time scale, which is actually in this case, just given by the near equilibrium relaxation time analysis. Okay, so this is the case of an, uh, of an overoccupied system. So now let's look at the, uh, at the opposite limit where we start with a, where we start with a um, small number of very high energy degrees of freedom. Okay, and so uh, in this case, so again, evolution is shown over here for gluons and quarks. So in this case, we started with a, uh, with a very highly energetic quark, which I think has in this case, 30 times the equilibrium temperature of the system. Okay, so initially you have this, you have this kind of uh, single red peak of, uh, of highly energetic quarks. And so what will happen is as they interact with each other, they will emit these, uh, these soft radiation of uh, so soft quark and also soft gluon radiation, which has this characteristic, uh, characteristic Brems QCD Bremsstrahlung spectra. However, then in particular, if you look at here, the gluon sector, okay, what you'll find is that um, already after a very short period of time, the system will start to um, essentially develop this, uh, this thermalized infrared sector where this approach is sort of a, a thermal, uh, thermal distribution with an effective temperature that's, uh, <coughs> that's continuously growing, okay? And then, so what happens over the course of the dynamics is essentially that more and more radiation is emitted thereby heating up the temperature of this bath until eventually all of these hard guys begin to decay. And that's when kind of you enter this uh, um, when you when at the very last stages of the thermalization, you just have sort of a few few highly energetic remnants with everything else um, approaching the thermal distribution. Uh, and so in this process, really what happens at the end is that actually kind of, again, there's sort of a turbulent energy transport where essentially the energy is transmitted from the scale of your initial hard jets to the current equilibrium temperature to these multiple sequential, uh, sequential splittings. Now, what is interesting about this is that uh, I told you in the previous example that actually kind of what takes the longest for the system to thermalize is to actually do the final approach to equilibrium. And for that reason, in an overoccupied system, the thermalization time was determined by the equilibrium uh, relaxation rate. In this case, this is actually, well, <laughs> this is actually slightly different. So it turns out that such underoccupied system, they actually take a longer time to thermalize than uh, a corresponding near equilibrium system. Uh, they take, so the corresponding equilibrium rate would be one over alpha squared T. In this case, this takes a factor square root of Q where Q is the initial hard scale over T longer. And this is due to the fact that actually, um, um, that actually um, uh, to, for, for these, for these uh, high ener highly energetic particles to really lose their energy, um, uh, for these highly energy particles to really lose their energy, um, it takes a longer amount of time simply because they interact less efficiently uh, um, with, the, with the surrounding medium. So the rates of their interaction with the medium are, um, are smaller. Okay, so this, is, so this is sort of roughly how we understand different uh, thermalization patterns in, in QCD. So now um, let's look how they, how they actually play out during the early stages of a heavy ion collision. So, um, so let me, so, so to, to, set, to set the stage a little bit for this, so let me talk a little bit about uh, how we actually usually picture these initial stages. So, um, and how, how we can sort of, uh, sort of describe this theoretically. So um, of course, before the collision, we start with the, with the colliding nuclei, right? And um, it turns out that actually describing sort of the very first of the step of the collision is not, perhaps not even the most, uh, most complicated one, okay? So namely, if you just care about somehow, say the initial energy deposition or how, um, how that energy is, uh, is released into, <laughs> into a plasma, then this is actually which, something which can be calculated within say the color glass condensate effective theory of high energy QCD. And uh, essentially what this will lead you to is it will lead you to uh, a state which is essentially formed immediately after the collision, which is very far from equilibrium and completely dominated by the gluons. Okay. 
So in principle, by a large phase space of your occupancy of blue ones, so in principle, the system kind of looks over-occupied. Now, what is different here about sort of the, sort of the two well understood examples that I showed you before is that um, the plasma that is uh, created, so this gluon rich, highly occupied plasma that's created immediately after the collision of heavy nuclei, uh, is that this plasma and heavy ion collision is also subject to a very rapid longitudinal expansion whereby it kind of fills the empty space opening up behind the nuclei, behind the two nuclei, okay? And this really changes the problem in a, uh, in a significant way because it has, has two implications on the, basically if you look kind of at a, at a small cell somewhere in the middle where the plasma expands out there, okay? Um, then certainly that cell will be diluted and moreover also somehow particles which move very rapidly in either of these directions will quickly escape your central cell. And so on a very short time scale, the plasma will actually become highly anisotropic with the typical sort of transverse momenta much larger than the typical longitudinal momenta. Uh, okay, now how does this affect, um, how does this affect uh, now the thermalization pattern on a microscopic level? So um, to show you this, um, I show you here now uh, simulations of a evolution of a longitudinal, of such a longitudinally expanding plasma in QCD kinetic theory. And so, um, so in the left panel, you see sort of what the system looks like very initially. So this is kind of a, um, a 2D, or how do you call this, contour plots of, uh, of the distribution as a function of longitudinal and transverse momenta. So initially you have particles with very high transverse momenta, okay, but the longitudinal momenta are very small because the highly energetic particles have already escaped um, your mid-rapidity region, okay. Um, but the system is in principle very dense. Now, how does such a system thermalize? So it turns out that uh, uh, at some point, elastic interactions set in and they, they kind of tend to sort of stabilize the typical longitudinal momentum that you can get. However, they are not efficient enough in, in sort of re-isotropizing the system. And so instead, what happens is actually that even if the system was initially over-occupied, it first becomes actually dilute before thermalized. So very quickly, the system then becomes dilute, okay, and then essentially follows the thermalization pattern of an, of an, under, of an under occupied plasma, where essentially these few hard particles that you had sitting out over here, or that remain over here, they start to radiate soft radiation and, uh, and lose their energy towards, towards, uh, towards the soft past. And essentially equilibration is then, you can kind of see here these, these tails where this nearly collinear radiation is still, still sitting, coming in from, the, from your hard guys. Okay, and essentially thermalization is then completed when your sort of original semi-hard partons have had sufficient time to undergo such multiple, multiple splittings to essentially deposit all their energy towards the soft center, towards the, to, to the soft blast, which then becomes your thermalized concrete plasma. Okay, now. What is that? Okay, so so that's somehow so so that somehow is the is is the microphysics behind this. So now, what does this uh, what does this mean in terms of the macrophysics? Okay, and so now, of course, the good thing is if you have this kind of microscopic calculation at hand, you can you can calculate all the microscopic quantities, and um, you can um, you can see you can now go back and ask yourself, okay, when does the system become described by hydrodynamics, and uh, how does that happen, and uh, can we understand why we can use hydrodynamics at all in a, in a, in a heavy ion? So in order to answer that, let me, let me, first, uh, let me first say um, what, what one should be looking at. So, I mean, hydrodynamics is a, is a macroscopic effective theory of, well, supposedly universal, okay? And it's essentially based, uh, so, so it's, the, you described the evolution of the energy momentum tensor and it's based in an on an expansion around equilibrium where you have uh, essentially two expansion parameters. One of them is the Knudsen number, which is sort of, which you can think of as a, is a ratio of uh, the mean free pass over um, the typical macroscopic length scale in the system. So the system size or the expansion rate, okay? And the inverse Reynolds number, which classifies somehow how large are non-equilibrium uh, contributions to the energy momentum tensor compared to the corresponding equilibrium values, or how far is the system from equilibrium in human state. Um, so clearly here, the system we are dealing with in heavy ion collision is at least initially highly anisotropic. And so one of the key questions is then to understand how does this energy momentum tensor evolve from this highly anisotropic state towards a state which is, which is more isotropic. Okay? 
And this is essentially what is, uh, what is depicted here in this lower left panel, okay, where I show you now um, the evolution of the longitudinal pressure, the energy density divided by three and the transverse pressure in the system. And so they're all normalized such that asymptotically they would all go to the same value of one. Now, the different color curves here show you simulations in kinetic theory at three different coupling strengths, five lambda is five, 10, and 20, okay? And they're plotted uh, as a function of time in units of an equilibrium relaxation time, which I define as uh, through the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio, which we determine from kinetic theory, and the effective temperature of the system, which is just the fourth root of the energy density. And so the first thing that you can see is that actually, well, if you compare sort of the, the results of these kinetic theory calculations at different coupling strengths, that surprisingly little difference actually emerges in, in, in somehow, um, in somehow uh, um, changing this coupling strengths, okay? And this really points to the fact that if you, you know, study the equilibration of such a expanding plasma at realistic plasma, uh, coupling strengths, then the evolution of these macroscopic quantities really seems to be controlled by one single time scale, which is essentially given by this equilibrium relaxation rate, so by the shear viscosity and the typical energy scale of the system. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can, you can now compare um, this microscopically calculated non evolution with the theory of hydrodynamics. And so the predictions for the hydrodynamic evolution are shown here. Um, in terms of these dashed lines. And so what you'll find is that roughly on the time scale of one equilibrium relaxation time, okay, the system actually does become describable by hydrodynamics. Okay? And so um, if, you, if you kind of convert this estimate of a time scale where well, the relaxation time is given by the shear viscosity and the effective temperature, and you kind of plug in now phenomenological inferred values for the shear viscosity and the typical entropy density in a heavy ion collision, you really end up with, uh, with thermalization times on the order, on the order of, uh, of one Fermi over, over C or so, which is on the order, uh, which is pretty much in line with what one learned earlier from phenomenology. Now, <laughs> um, what, is, what is further interesting about this, however, okay, is that uh, if you actually now look what does the system look like at the time where hydrodynamics applies? Okay, you see, for instance, the system is actually still very far from equilibrium. Okay, so uh, you have a huge anisotropy in the pressure still, which is of order one. And in fact, also this, uh, um, uh, I mean, the ratio of the expansion rate to sort of the equilibrium relaxation time is also of order one. And so really what turns out is that for some miraculous reason, hydrodynamics seems to be applicable when both of these expansion <laughs> variables, so the Knudsen number, which is essentially was plotted always on the x-axis here and the inverse Reynolds number, which was, which was basically plotted on the y-axis, the other plot um, are of order one. Uh, and uh, just to show you that this is somehow, so, so there's been a number of studies of this. So um, people have looked at this in QCD kinetic theory. People have looked at this in, uh, in, uh, young, uh, in QCD with pure gluons. Okay, you can also just do simple calculations in the, uh, in say using Boltzmann equation in relaxation time calculation or calculation, holographic calculations in N equals four super young mills. Uh, via holography. And it turns out that if you, I mean, first of all, if you compare these calculations in, in sort of in units of this, uh, this macroscopic time scales, then A, they don't even look so different, okay? But they all show the same pattern that, okay, there is this somehow surprising effectiveness of, uh, of viscous fluid dynamics, which is really what allows us to, to somehow use, or this is somehow what we believe now, is that this is what it actually allows us to use hydrodynamics in the MBI. Okay, so now in the last 15 minutes or so that I have, I want to um, now go on and somehow um, use and uh, apply this understanding to somehow know, try to explore whether um, not only with theory, but also by comparing to experiment, we can learn something about uh, um, early time dynamics of heavy ion collisions. Okay. And so, uh, I mean, the first thing that we did in this regard is a few years ago, actually, well, a couple of years ago, is that um, we kind of tried to take all this progress that we have now in understanding evolution of macroscopic quantities during the pre-equilibrium stage, try to put this into a realistic heavy ion model and see if this has any impact on the uh, on, on typical experimental observables that you do. Okay? So, um, for example, shown over here is really a calculation where we where we did a color glass condensate calculation of the initial state. 
uh, whereby we can follow field like pressures at early times, which are negative. Then this is essentially the time when you produce particles. We pass that over to kinetic theory calculation, which then smoothly matches again to the hydrodynamics. Okay, and then you can, for instance, vary the time when you match to hydrodynamics or vary the time when you match to kinetic theory, and you can see whether any kind of differences emerge. And what you find is generally, if you look at things like uh, elliptic flow or typical heavy ion observables, okay, um, the effects of actually including such a dynamical pre-equilibrium stage on the expansion dynamics or the experimental observable related to that is really very, very small and uh, is essentially, yeah, essentially not, <laughs> there's not much hope in observing. Okay. And so this is on the one hand good news, okay, because it kind of justifies a procedure that's been adapted in the field for a long time. Then they're just doing hydrodynamic simulations to learn about properties of the of the quark gluon plasma. And so, okay, yeah, there are no, no big uncertainties from the from the initial state in this kind of analysis. Okay. On the other hand, it kind of illustrates also the, the difficulty um, that you have if you really want to gain um, access to early time non equilibrium dynamics. Okay, so. How can you then go? So, so, so now say you really want to learn about this, uh, this regime, which is certainly what I want to do. Okay? So, what, op so what options do you have? Okay? And so essentially this leaves you with kind of, uh, so well, at least that's the three that I could think of. Okay? So um, either you stay within the realm of a heavy ion collision, okay? and you have to find some kind of observable related to expansion dynamics or bulk, which is really only sensitive to early time dynamics and essentially not affected by anything that happens after the system is close to equilibrium. Turns out something like this exists and I'll say a few words about this. Um, the other option that you have is you could try to, so the reason that you don't really see something in heavy ion collisions is because of course, because this pre-equilibrium stage is very short and then the hydrodynamic expansion is approximately 10 times that long. So you could try to sort of reduce the lifetime of the system by going to a smaller system and thereby potentially enhance the impact of the pre-equilibrium stage. Um, that's very interesting and very promising by itself, but uh, this is uh, somehow theoretically too complicated because then um, uh, we, we simply don't really have the tools to do that. Okay, And you may have to worry about all kinds of other things. Um, then the third possibility that you have, and that's, uh, that's what I'll address first is that well, you look at sort of qualitatively different observables. So you exploit the fact that, well, you don't only produce hadrons and heavy ion collisions, but you can also look at other observables by say studying things which are either genuinely non-equilibrium probes such as high energy jets, okay? They are clearly non-equilibrium probes. So you can still do non-equilibrium physics with them or you study electromagnetic fields. Okay. So let's look at uh, let's look at electromagnetic radiation. And so here the idea is uh, is very simple. Uh -huh. So uh, electromagnetic probes, so photons and dileptons, they are produced throughout the space-time evolution of heavy ion collisions. Okay. And the beauty about these is is that unlike anything that interacts strongly with the plasma, these guys is they escape the collision unscathed as they do not interact strongly with the quark gluon. Okay. Now, in principle, you have two types of probes. So you have, uh, you can have photons or, or lepton pairs, okay? And it turns out that if you, if you really wanna, so if you really, again, if you wanna focus on the pre-equilibrium stage, you have to, you have this very short, short uh, space-time volume that the, that, the, uh, that the system spends there. So you have to find very special kinematics where uh, essentially the pre-equilibrium stage outshines the rest of the evolution. And with photons, this is tricky because even though you could think about looking at high momentum photons, high momentum photons you can also produce in the later stages when the plasma starts to expand very strongly and then the expansion increases the momentum. Okay, and so for that reason, it's actually a good idea to look at, um, at dileptons, so electron positron or, or mu plus mu minus pairs, which have a very, very large, which have a large invariant mass on the order of GeVs. Okay, so in the initial state, you have these highly energetic particles present. Okay, and so you could produce them, for instance, to quark anti quark annihilation. So this is just a, a leading order process. Okay, whereas if you try to do the same thing in a thermal plasma at a lower temperature, okay, then you simply cannot, I mean, you simply very rarely can provide the energy for producing such a high invariant mass state. Okay, and so the production from the late stage is actually thermally suppressed by a Boltzmann factor, so exponentially by the mass of the dilepton pair over the temperature. Now, to calculate this, uh, 
um, now there is something that is uh, that, that makes this con that makes this a little bit complicated, though, is that uh, if you actually look at uh, well, you, you try to now produce star leptons from the <laughs> from the pre-equilibrium QGP. Then I told you somewhat earlier on that the pre-equilibrium QGP is highly gluon dominated. Okay, and so um, so the production during the pre-equilibrium stage is also to some extent suppressed by, on the one hand, the fact that it lasts relatively short, and the other the other part that uh, quark anti quark pairs are, or you first have to produce quarks and anti quarks in order to then produce your dileptons. Okay, and so um, so there's kind of a so it's kind of a two step process which also reduces the pre equilibrium yield. Now uh, let me skip that. So. Um, Nevertheless, I mean, you can you can do it, right? So now that we have somehow the evolution, so we have the evolution for how um, how the system evolves microscopically during the initial stage. Okay, and so um, essentially what we did is we we took that to calculate pre-equilibrium dileptone production from this leading order quark anti quark annihilation process. Um, Instead of sort of directly doing this based on the phase space distributions that we have in our kinetic theory, what we did is we essentially parametrized them, but we took into account the important effects that the system is highly anisotropic and that uh, quarks are really suppressed during this pre equilibrium stage. And so the result that you then get um, is shown here in these two pictures. So both of them show you the, the, the invariant mass spectrum. Uh, so, so they show you the number of dilepton pairs per unit invariant mass per unit rapidity as a function of the invariant mass of the dilepton. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and so if we focus, so, so, so there's different lines on this plot. Okay. So let's focus on the full lines here. So the blue shows you the full spectrum of, uh, of, of, of dilepton pairs that's, that's produced through this process throughout essentially the entire evolution of the of the plasma, although of course at late stages not much is produced in invariant masses above one GeV anymore. Okay. Um, now, of course, what we can do since we since we understand uh, you know when hydrodynamics works and, and and when it shouldn't, we can break this up into what what proportion of these dileptons is produced early on and what produce what proportion is produced late. So the black line here shows you the proportion of the dileptons that's actually produced. Um, before the time that hydrodynamics should be applicable. So this is actually, so here related to this, this kind of scale of before one equilibrium relaxation time, so to say, okay? Whereas um, the gray line is the rest that you gain, um, that you gain from the, from the hydrodynamics phase, uh, from, the, from the later stage hydrodynamic phase. And so what you can see is that if you go to invariant masses above something like two GeV in this case, uh, for somehow, reasonable values of the shear viscosity, okay? Um, you can, whoop, uh, this pre-equilibrium production really outshines the, uh, outshines the later stage thermal production. Now, there's one other thing that, that, you, can, that you can see, which is, um, which is looking at, uh, which is looking at uh, comparing the, the full and the dashed curves. So the full curves in this case take into account this effect that uh, you start, so you expect that the initial state is, uh, is highly gluon dominated and you first have to produce the quarks. Whereas what we did in the, for, for the dashed lines, we assumed that essentially the abundances of, uh, of quarks and gluons throughout the pre-equilibrium stage um, are as they are in equilibrium. And so you don't have a suppression of quarks at early times. Uh -huh. And so, of course, well, the more quarks you have present in your in your early stages, okay. The, I mean, the larger this will you boost the dilepton production, okay. And so, well, in that case, you would even outshine this at at something like a, like 1.5 GeV or so, okay. Um, but uh, I mean, the, the real message is that is if if you look at somewhere in this invariant mass range, okay, you can outshine the thermal production, okay, and by actually doing something like a measurement, okay, you could perhaps even something learn about the, uh, about the early time chemistry of the core. Now, if we look at the right plot, um, this shows you two things. So the one thing that this shows you is uh, it shows you a sensitivity to um, um, to the macro, so, the, so to, to the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio. And so the, real, the way the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio enters in this, in, in this kind of calculation is that, well, that sets the, I mean, so, so on the one hand, that sets the scale for, um, for when the system, I mean, for, for, for when the system, how quickly the system 
collaborates. Okay. On the other hand, that also um, that also has an effect because you, you you I mean you have to produce the correct outcome at the end, so it also kind of slightly changes the properties of the initial state that you have to consider. And so both of these effects um, are kind of uh, factored in when you look at uh, when you look at different ratios uh, of the shear viscous. So if you look at results for 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 um, and for some smaller shear viscosity to entropy density ratio, then what you'll find is that actually your initial plasma has to be sort of uh, sort of slightly hotter in a sense. Okay, so you get uh, uh, you get production going out to to a little bit larger invariant masses even. Yeah. Um, um, again, it's a huge difference whether or not your initial your plasma in the early stage is has is gluon dominated or not. Okay. Yeah, um, but yeah. So so this so, so so this is the other sensitivity you have, right? So you have a sensitivity to a the dynamics of equilibration, right, and b the chemistry of your plasma. Okay. Now, I told you about sort of the sort of the background that comes from thermal production. The other thing that you of course have to worry about is that um, well, if you really go to high invariant masses, right, then you can also produce these dileptons not through the thermal evolution of the plasma, but through some kind of uh, um, just to initial hard scattering, so the Drelian process, okay? And so um, we try to also estimate where at some point the Drelian process takes over. So these are these are calculations of just the pure, um, uh, of this just, just pure um, initial state dilepton production in the, uh, in the initial hard scatterings, okay? And so what you see is that, well, they stay, so while well, at high invariant mass, they eventually come to dominate. There is really this window where, you know, somehow the pre-equilibrium phase outshines both the thermal production and the Drelian process. And so somehow the range that one wants to look at is somewhere between one to three GeV or maybe two to four, something like this. And um, um, the experimental colleagues that we've talked to, like uh, like Michael Wim, and so they actually tell us that indeed this is something that uh, that should be accessible with the next range of uh, uh, next generation of heavy ion detectors. Here, the main challenge is actually to suppress backgrounds from open heavy flavor decays, uh, but this uh, this should be doable. Okay, now how much time do I have left? Can I discuss one more application, or should I wrap up? Uh, maybe you can take. Uh... Three, four minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That, that should be fine. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I told you about these three possibilities to study the initial state. So I've now talked about electromagnetic radiation. Um, it turns out there's also sort of something, <laughs> some actually very direct probe of the initial state, which is if you if you if you study actually entropy production in the collision. And the reason for this is very simple. Okay, uh, I mean, when do you produce entropy? You only produce uh, entropy when the system is significantly out of equilibrium, and in heavy ion collisions, this is really only the case in the very early stages. Yeah. Um, so. Entropy tension is something that's dominated by the early times, and it turns out that's something that's essentially also measurable, okay, and it's measurable to the simplest observable by just measuring how many charged particles you produce in a collision. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out that somehow with the progress that we've, or that's been made in understanding all these macroscopic properties of the initial state, you can now actually really write down a map between somehow how is the initial energy per unit rapidity that's deposited in the initial scattering, okay, how does that map to the entropy that's there when the system undergoes that hydrodynamic expansion. But since this hydrodynamic expansion isn't close to ideal, there's no further entropy produced throughout this hydrodynamic expansion, at least very little, okay? So the entropy at the, at the, at the stage where the system thermalizes is approximately equal to the entropy of the system at freeze out, okay? And that is when essentially um, the entropy is just converted into, into, into charged particles that are then measured um, in the detector. Okay. And so it turns out that uh, so you can do a relatively simple calculation and you can actually make this, this kind of relation explicit. Okay? So you can now write down an explicit relation between initial energy density of the system and the charged particle multiplicity that's being produced. Okay? And so relation is given over here. So if you look at how many charged particles you produce, this will depend on uh, the initial energy density, actually not directly, but to, to some funny powers. It will depend on things like the equation of state, which is parameterized to effective number of degrees of freedom. It will depend on things like the viscosity and, um, <clears throat> and uh, the number of charged part, uh, the entropy per charged particle in the hadron. Okay. And so it turns out that uh, 
Now, it, really, if you look at somehow all of that enters this relation, there's some things that are known and some things that are less known. So the things that we don't know that well are on the one hand, really, what is the initial energy density? Because that's on the one hand depends on properties inside uh, in, inside nuclei, okay? So like gluon distributions inside nuclei, but then also the way how you say you do a perturbative calculation of the initial energy density. And the other thing is the, is the high temperature uh, shear viscosity, because this is really the shear viscosity in the regime where the system where the system thermalizes and the calculations assume to be a constant, but I mean, that's of course where the calculation applies, okay? And uh, so this is something that's really not, not that well constrained in the relevant range, say around four times TC or so that you would have for LHC. And so nevertheless, I mean, if you have such a relation, what you can try to do is you can kind of try to do and this is, this is some work in progress. So I'm just gonna flash this here really quick. You can now kind of try to extract both of them at the same time, okay? So the initial energy density is in principle something that you can calculate if you have, <laughs> if you have a model of, uh, of parton distributions in, in, uh, in nuclei, transverse momentum dependent parton distributions actually, okay? So there you need to know essentially the gluon saturation scale QS and, um, and here you would need to know the shear viscosity, okay? So, the details of the calculation are here. I'll skip it, okay? And I'll just kind of show you, show you sort of a proof of principle of this. So what we try to do is we basically parametrized the, um, the initial, so we basically parametrized the gluon distributions in the, inside the nucleus in terms of a saturation scale, okay? Um, we then took that simple relation that tells you how many charged particles are produced, okay? And then we try to essentially simultaneously determine what is the, what is the typical value of the saturation scale and uh, what is the value of the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio, okay? And so by matching, of course, the heavy ion data. Um, and so here's, the, so here's a plot of the charged multiple multiplicity versus, uh, versus centrality for different collision systems. So we take RIC and LHC into account. You see different, so different curves here show you different realizations of the model. Of course, these are already after, after so to say, doing statistical analysis. So all of these describe uh, the data very well, okay? And so indeed what you find is that, well, if you, if you, <laughs> if you, if you actually go and fit such a model to the, to the data, indeed you find that uh, um, you can get constraints on the saturation scale and the high, high temperature shear viscosity simultaneously, which then end up in such a likelihood, a likelihood contour. Uh, now, of course, if you compare this with, the, with what you can learn from other experiments, right, then um, of course, you can also learn about the properties of, uh, of parton distributions from uh, looking at uh, just electron uh, proton scattering or electron ion scattering, so physics at an electron ion collider, okay? And so you could kind of picture how this would give another constraint onto onto such a diagram and thereby really allow you to, uh, to, to, to also pin down um, simultaneously what are properties of, uh, what are properties, what are fundamental properties of, of gluon distributions in nuclei and transport properties of, uh, of hot QCD matter, such as the shear viscosity. Yeah. So, um, so the main point here or the main takeaway that I want to say is that, well, once you understand this pre-equilibrium stage, you really have a one-to-one -one connection between the physics of your initial state, which is part of distributions of, of, of nuclei and the physics of your final state in RBI collision, which is what do you measure, okay? And so one can somehow, I think, start to explore more of this potential um, in, terms of, in terms of pinning down some, some interesting points. Okay, so with that, uh, let me just, uh, I think I'll just flash my conclusions and uh, since I'm already over time and uh, hope that there are some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Uh, uh, so I opened the floor for questions. Please go ahead. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, but I'll wait for others. Okay. Can I ask one? Yeah, go ahead, Shaj. Uh, Soren, can you go back to your slide number 15, please? One five, yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one or two earlier. The one which showed the uh, various different curves. Uh, of this one here? This one, yeah. Four, yeah. 15 is the one I had in mind. I am a little puzzled by this, and uh, it appears to be almost incredible 
that no matter what the underlying theory is, the picture remains the same. Does that mean that there is something basic, interesting physics that is obvious and people are missing it? Or is it that everybody's actually way off the real their calculations has huge approximations and stopped when they got the results they wanted? So, <laughs> so, so, so the answer is somewhere in between, I think. So, um, okay, so, so you know, okay, so, so you know, in a sense, you know two things, okay? So you know, I mean, so they are, okay, so, so these calculations, first of all, these calculations are done under certain symmetry constraints, okay? So what you do is, technically speaking, you study a longitudinally expanding system of infinite transverse extent. Yeah, basically, you can neglect, neglect the transverse expansion of the system because you're only studying a relatively short time scale of a Fermi over C or so, okay? Okay, and so, so such a system turns out will always thermalize, okay? So um, you kind of, you kind of dictated to eventually go to this hydrodynamic curve here. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is, no, so, so you know that the asymptotics over here has to be like this. The eventuality okay? is not the issue, I suppose, as the fact that between one to 10 on your axis, uh, mm -hmm. almost from two to 10, there is no difference. Yeah. But this is the hydrodynamic regime somehow, right? So, I mean, this is, so, so this is, I think, Either, I think this is even just first order hydrodynamics. Okay, so in principle, you can you, you can look at first order hydrodynamics just gives you this line. Okay, and now you could say, okay, let me look at second order hydrodynamics. Also, if you were to look second order hydrodynamics, this would give you some kind of epsilon spread. Okay, if you if you permit me to change my mm -hmm. second part of the question, second order viscous hydro has wrought a huge amount of uh, experience and history and uh, practitioners and what have you. So from two onwards that you want to go and start meeting there was presumably the goal of the rest of the guys. Yeah, this was the goal of the rest of the guys, yes. So, so in some sense, they have made approximations just so that they actually end up there, nothing more. So Wait, for instance, sure I... in your case, when you say it is a low calculation, and mm -hmm. if I say that one should be uh, uh, applying, considering loops also, and in QCD, there are all kinds of loops and uh, NLOs and what have you that you should really have when your couplings are really becoming large. That already is a, a huge amount of approximation, which I don't know how to handle or even control. No, I and, 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 and I agree, right? But I mean, so so this is this is why I kind of mentioned this point over here. Okay, I mean, within just say within these three calculations at different coupling things, I think the shear viscosity vanishes by a factor of uh, differs by a factor of four or so. Okay, yeah, and then you can ask yourself if you if you do this thing and you actually compare the theories at different footings, so in units of day, so that they have the same hydrodynamic asymptotics and so forth, okay? So all these theories are here compared in a way that the hydrodynamic asymptotics is the same for all of them, okay? And they're actually all conformal systems also, okay? Yeah, so this is the two things that go, that, that go in here. Yeah? So they have high symmetry, they're conformal, and they have the same hydrodynamic asymptotics, okay? Under that, okay, then, then you can then you can vary and you see, okay, what's left to vary doesn't doesn't have such a big effect anymore. Yeah. yeah. And so I mean in part, I expect that a lot of this, you know, a lot of this this higher order correction, so to say, yeah, can be can be captured by look working in these macroscopic scales. Yeah? I mean, of course, you go from leading order to next to leading order, yeah, your shear viscosity will change dramatically. Okay. Yeah. But the hydrodynamic asymptotic is still actually going to be the same, okay? So how much this curve will really change? I don't think it will actually change that much. Yeah? But that's because one has taken out, so to say, a lot of the leading order scaling. Yeah? Yeah, and this is how we extrapolate our results also to realistic coupling strings, right? I mean, we don't take the eta over s value that we get at a coupling strength of trend, right? We, 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 try to, we, we try to factor out all the dependence on eta over s get these kind of curves, okay? And then use a phenomenological value at the end. Yes, maybe I can ask, uh, maybe Rajiv, if you have a question, you can continue maybe, but uh, no, no, since no, no, I have a question. Continue. You can continue. I have a question, but that is completely different than this. Okay. 
Uh, so my question is related to this. So uh, this eta by s value. So you showed a couple of uh, possibilities: point one six and point three two. So did you choose your coupling so that it matches uh, uh, the leading order calculation that you're doing? Matches no, we this actually. Value? Yeah, no, no. I mean, so so this this essentially brings me back to this point over here, right? So we do the so so we so we do what we try to do is we try to do the, the simulations in a range where the coupling is reasonably strong, okay? Yeah, but where also you know the calculation still still makes some sense at least, okay? Um, I mean, I think to get an ether over s of say 0.16, I'm not even sure this is actually. Well, I, it should probably be possible, but you'd have to use a coupling, which is, I don't know, hundreds of thousands or something like this, right? And then it's, I mean, it, it, it definitely, my, what you're doing doesn't, simply doesn't make sense anymore, okay? So what we try to do is we try to do the calculation in a regime where the calculation makes sense. I think our eta over S value here is are typically of the order one, okay? Mm -hmm. And, but then we take out the dependence on eta over S uh, by, Simply Steering. here, comparing, for instance, exactly by Steering. scaling them in the in the units of this equilibrium relaxation time, so they have the same hydrodynamic asymptotics. You see, there's essentially no differences. Okay, and then in the final step, we do the extrapolation. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and, 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 and so let's, I mean, an, an analogous thing would be to say, okay, the goal is not to calculate eta over s directly, but maybe I want to calculate a ratio of, say, tau pi to t temperature times tau pi divided by eta over s. So, like ratios of transport coefficients or so. Uh, and I mean, also, I think in perturbative calculations, these things are much better behaved. Uh, okay, yeah. Other questions? Uh, uh, Ricky, can I ask a question? Uh, this is Rajiv Valero. Uh, okay, so yeah. Surindu has his hand up, so okay. I'll get Surindu's and then yeah. yours. All right, okay. So go ahead, Surindu. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, so um, my question was about dileptons, actually. So if you can mm -hmm. go ahead a couple of slides. Yeah. Um, yeah I guess here are the results. Yeah, slide, yeah. Here. yeah. Right. So there's this uh, window, which is the interesting thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the window is very interesting because that's where the physics that you are looking at uh, shows up. Now, why does the window come at mass less than 3.5 and mass higher than one? Yeah, so, well, what okay. Set the scale. What sets the scale, yeah. Um, this is so, so this is a good question, actually. So I mean, well, okay, so let's first talk about the physics that sets this, and then we can think about what sets the scale, right? Um, so the physics that, that limits you to the to the high invariant mass is Drelia. Yeah. So there you have to so there you have to basically compare, I mean the, I mean the hard scattering that you have from incoming partons to what you produce in that pre-equilibrium stage. Okay. I'm not sure that I'm easily able to derive what sets the scale for that. Um, because you know physics is very different, right? I mean, on the one hand, you convolve parton distributions, and you and you look. In the other case, you first produce the quarks. Well, I mean, you first maybe produce gluons, then you produce quarks, and then you produce the leptons. Okay, so uh, that's far from obvious to me what really sets the scale there. Yeah. Um, in the other case, you're fighting against the thermal production. Okay, and so there, um, so so there. Uh, let's see. So that's kind of the region. So where this the... should be something like the temperature at which the plasma equilibrates, or something like this, right? So it should be. Should, should, so it should be related to so, that. So does this have anything to do with the scale of eta by s? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it depends on eta by s. So in the paper we have, so unfortunately I don't have to plot for eta over s is 0.16 here. But so, so this, this scale where essentially pre-equilibrium dominates over thermal, this also depends on eta by s, right? Because eta by s on the one hand changes, you know, how long do you spend in this pre-equilibrium regime, right? But then to essentially arrive at the same temperature later on, it also changes the energy scale at the at the initial so, time. That's right. So then this question is closely related to the question of uh, the, the slide that you were talking about uh, when Rajiv asked the question. OK? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it is. Yeah, right. absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. OK, so this, this, this is uh, this question we have discussed already. So let me go back to the other side. OK, so 
it uh, no i don't want to come here because this ah, okay. question we have already discussed and okay. you know, there could be more to say about it but we haven't talked about the other question at all okay so what what is the uv scale here which uh, separates the intermediate region from the perturbative region from the drelian okay. region you mean yeah from the drelian region yeah, yeah, this, and, this, I said this, so, I cannot. So, so, yeah, right, yeah. But <laughs> I think you you kind of already got half the answer because you do need uh, secondary quarks and antiquarks to produce these uh, objects, to produce these photons, off equilibrium pho photons, pre-equilibrium photons. And what you really need is to figure out what is the, what is the typical energy scale how much does the gluon energy uh, dilute before you start producing sufficient number of QQ bar pairs? Okay, and there should be a simple, fairly simple estimator of that. I yeah. think. I mean, it could be it could be that it's some kind of QS type scale that sets this. I yeah. I, I I agree. I agree, but it's. I mean, no, it's it's a multiplier. I mean, over the, thing is, the, 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 the thing is, and I mean, this is this is to some extent what's shown in this bands, right? I mean, it is so what you produce here in this in this last so, so you know the closer you move to the to the to the thermal point, okay, in a sense, the more robust the estimate also becomes. Yeah? Um, the further you move out here, the more you rely on re, I mean, you see a larger sensitivity to this chemistry, everything, right? Um, the more you rely on, you know, really what did the plasma look like very, very early, right? Sort of immediately after it was born. Yeah? Um, and I think one should try to do a better calculation of that, really run that through the kinetics really fully and, and, and calculate the startup tones in, 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 in studies. Yeah, the, what you're saying yeah. is correct. If you want, want an exact answer, but you want to understand the scale yeah. where these effects set in. And that scale should be a much easier thing to estimate. Oh, this I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, uh, so Rajiv Halero and then Rajiv Gawai has one, one more question. But again, sorry, may, may, may I just want to comment one more thing, right? So, okay. so, so again, yeah. surrender, right? I mean, the, the scale where this happens, right, also depends very crucially on the chemistry, right? If you look at just where the where say the two dashed red curves cross, right? I mean, you get almost like a factor of two or so, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. so, so it's very crucial. And the reason is that the chemistry is something that the system remembers actually all the way until it thermalizes almost. Yeah, because it's, it's the a pressure of evolution. It's exactly yeah. right, because you have to produce the quarks. Yeah. 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 Can you go back to slide number 18, please? Yep. Okay. Here you say on the point number one, you say that the early stages are sensitive to bulk properties. Right? Bulk viscosity? Ah, no, no, by, by, no, sorry. By, by bulk, I just meant, um, I just meant bulk, like bulk observables, right? Like, I mean, what, we, we, concretely, what I meant by this is actually the example that I talked about on entropy production. So find some hadronic observable, right, which does not really have a big effect during this hydro stage. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, somehow I thought it, you're talking about bulk viscosity. No, that's okay. okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, Rajiv? The other Rajiv. Okay. Uh, okay, I sorry, I uh, took a time to uh, get the uh, mic on. Okay. The question that I had was on the dieleptrons only. So can we go back to that slide, please? Yeah. 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 Uh, there are two, one is a comment and one is a question. So let me just mm -hmm. first make a comment. Uh, there is a kind of a sense of deja vu that one gets for a person who has been in this game for a while. Uh, when there was a claim made that uh, uh, temperatures of the plasma would be made, this was precisely the window which was actually said to be the great window in which temperature measurements will take place. Uh, right from the SPS days to all the way to the Alice days. And uh, the question really is, uh, uh, is this something which is uh, completely calculation dependent or model dependent and not really something which you can uh, say is uh, very concrete? So 
So, I mean, when we do these estimates, right? What really goes into these estimates is essentially these pressure curves that I showed you, right? Then with this, you parameterize the phase space distributions that you have, right? And then you decide whether you want to account for, for suppression of quarks or not, which we also, I mean, we, we basically calculated how quarks are produced or we assume quarks are always there, right? And then you do it, right? So, and let's put it like this, right? I mean, I have a very, very hard time seeing how you cannot produce the, the leptons here, at least. I mean, how you can sort of say, go below the blue curve that's shown, okay? Yeah, because you see, I mean, I mean, you've studied, I mean, this is what we discussed before, right? You study a huge range of models, you find, okay, this is roughly how the system equilibrates, this is roughly how long it takes, right? And this tells us all about, you know, how the energy density of the plasma evolves at early terms, right? And then if quarks are present in the plasma, you will produce these guys, right? So you cannot just simply fit an exponential here, there will be this excess from the pre-equilibrium here. Yeah. Um, Have you seen the Alice results of September 2020, where they say, that in the uh, data that they have collected so far, there is no conclusion on temperature? Uh, no, I'm not sure I have, uh, I'm not sure I know the exact results you're talking about. I mean, as far as I know, there is, there is no measurement of this because the problem is the, the subtraction the, the, of the, the heavy flavors. The yeah. heavy ion meeting which took place on 17th of September, 2020, there is a talk by Michel where there is a figure of the Alice results. And uh, everything seems to fit beautifully for the so-called Hadron cocktail. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the thing, yes, okay. I mean, the, yeah, this is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the signal to background can be a hundred, okay? Yeah, this is not an so, easy so measurement. This will, is why you need you very, very good instrumentation. First for the thermal part, and then for the pre-equilibrium part. Say that again. So what kind of statistics slash technology improvement will actually give you a signal first for thermal uh, uh, measurements from Alice and then the uh, on top of it, the pre-equilibrium. Yeah, okay. So, so, so what you need to do is, what you need to do is you need to suppress these heavy flavor decays. Okay, and the way you do this is by displaced, I mean, by measuring the displaced vertex and then cutting this out. Yeah. Um, I know this better. So at LH, so I know this that so LHCB they say they can do this. Okay. Yeah. What's the exact status for our lease? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah? I mean, so, I've I've presented this to our lease people in, in in the viewpoint of their you know of their of their upgrade and they are they're thinking about whether they can do this or not. But I don't. Yeah. I'm, uh, this I'm not enough expert, you know, okay? I mean, what exact developments there? I mean, in principle, you need good vertex resolution of the, to, to cut out this decays, yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, so if not, then let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks and, a lot. Okay.